four, Social Security, Clothing Allowances for Orphans and Unsupported Children, Amendment Bill, first reading. Another one for New Zealand First. I call the Honourable Member Tracy Martin. Sure Lucky order. girl. Sure order, Mr Speaker. <laughs> I move that the Social Security Clothing Allowances for Orphans and Unsupported sure. Children Amendment Bill be sure. now read a first time. I nominate the Social Services Committee to consider the bill. Mr Speaker, there is a story behind this bill, and I beg the indulgence of the House to explain the personal connection that has been one of the drivers behind this member's bill. In the 1940s, my mother Anne was two years old and living in Christchurch with her five-year-old brother Barry and their mother Beverly. Their father Jim was away at war. One day, Beverly took the kids to the next door neighbours. Nobody knows what she told them, but she left the kids there and that was the last time they ever saw their mother. It would be 45 years later that she would be able to make contact with people who would speak about Beverly and what had happened to her after that day she abandoned her children. We now know that Beverly went on to live a completely new life, never mentioning her children to her new workmates or friends until her passing of toxemia in the 1950s. After Beverly left, or some months after Beverly left, my mother's paternal grandmother finally became aware of her grandchildren's circumstances and showed up at that door. Originally, she only took Barry with her because grandfather had said that he could bring the boy home because he could work but leave the girl. Thankfully, a few months later, Granny could stand it no longer, and she came back to collect the little Anne. As life would have it, Anne and Barry were loved and cared for by their granny for approximately the next eight years. The army deducted a shilling from the children's father's pay and paid this to their grandmother. When the war was over, their father came home. He took time to readjust to life on Civvy Street. He entered a common law marriage with Maud Mohi, and it was another traumatic time for these children when their father arrived to take them to live with himself and his new wife in Hastings. My great-grandmother shifted to Napier to follow the children. I recognise today that while each circumstances might be different, grandparents are still grandparents and kids are still kids, nothing has changed but the times we find ourselves in. It is this personal connection and an innate sense of fairness that has been the driver behind this member's bill under my name. This bill does one thing and one thing only. Bluntly and in a nutshell, it says that if a child has been identified as an orphan or an unsupported child, then with regard to the clothing allowance eligibility, it makes no difference who is caring for them. A child being cared for by kin carers requires no less clothing than a child being cared for by an unrelated adult. However, orphans and unsupported children are not eligible to receive the clothing allowance. This member's bill proposes to give orphans and unsupported children clothing allowance parity with a foster child. Its goal is to have a single clause inserted into the Social Security Bill, Clause 29B. A person who receives an orphan's or unsupported child's benefit in respect of a child is also entitled to receive a clothing allowance for that child at the same rate as is determined by the Chief Executive from time to time under Section 363 of the Children, Young Persons and Their Families Act 1989. That is it, Mr. Speaker. That is all this little bill does. But what a difference it will make to the lives of these children and their kin carers. Mr Speaker, before I enter into the substantive content of the speech, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the previous and current work by the Minister of Social Development in this area. In 2009, it was the Honourable Paula Bennett who took the steps required to raise the main payment that caregivers receive to match the orphan's benefit and the unsupported child's benefit to those made to foster carers. This minister also provided 500 respite care places per year for these children in week-long holiday health camps, and I know that the kin carers were grateful for this support. I also wish to acknowledge that the minister and I have had positive interactions around our mutual desire to recognise and support these kin carers, very often grandparents raising grandchildren. I am grateful to have recently been a member of a ministerial reference group around the allocation of $35 million over the next four financial years that has been set aside in contingency for extended family members caring for children and in recognition of the difficult job that they do. The minister, however, will also concede that if all children are not recognised as equal inside legislation, then there is a real danger that at the end of that four-year period, kin carers will once again find themselves back at square one. 
I also want to recognise that we are, as a nation, in restrictive financial times and that the Select Committee will have to take these factors into consideration. However, Mr Speaker, there are times and there are issues where fairness and equity, particularly where children are concerned, where these must be the drivers of decision-making in the first instance and then a can-do lens around funding should be applied. Mr Speaker, I want to reiterate what this bill seeks to achieve. The intention of this bill is to recognise in statute that an orphan is an orphan, whether placed with foster parents or caregivers, and that all state support should be based upon the circumstances of the child, not the circumstances of the adult. This must be one of the only pieces of legislation where a distinction is based upon blood and not on any other criteria. For a variety of reasons, more and more children are finding themselves in the unenviable position of being declared an orphan or an unsupported child by the state. Kin carers are being targeted by social services to step up and take in these children, which they do. We should recognise that the majority of kin carers looking after the day-to-day -day needs of these orphans and unsupported children tend to be grandparents who are now raising their grandchildren. So these kin carers step up only to find that these children are deliberately disadvantaged through lower support due to this very kin relationship. Children are being discriminated against by the state due to circumstances beyond their control. I do not believe that there is a member in this House who would argue that if you are raised by your grandparents or auntie, that you therefore wear fewer clothes than a child placed with people to whom they are not related. So if we do not argue that, then upon what does this discrimination stand? Just to make sure we are all clear on how these children find themselves in these circumstances, I would like to outline the criteria for the two separate categories. A child is considered an orphan by the state if their parents have died or can't be found or when they can't look after their child because they have a long-term illness or incapacity. A child is considered an unsupported child when their parents can't support them because of a family breakdown. Children must be expected to be in caregivers' care for 12 months or more for support to be even accessed. This criteria was, has raised its own set of issues for those children whose parents are imprisoned for sentences of three, six or nine months and are placed with caregivers. These children are not eligible for even the base support outlined here, but that is for another day. It is worth noting at this point that when a child is supported by the state in either of these circumstances, that the natural parents are required to pay child support through the Inland Revenue Child Support Scheme should they be earning. I would request that the Social Services Select Committee take this revenue into account when considering this bill and its expenditure. I would also request that the Select Committee recognise that more than half of these children are reported as having serious physical and psychological problems as a result of the abuse and neglect they experienced prior to coming into their grandparents' or kin carers' homes. However, research shows us that 86% of these children report significant improvement over time and that this is directly attributed to the stability of care, the resilience and commitment of these caregivers. We ask the Select Committee to consider the cost savings these kin carers facilitate for the state by stepping up to the proverbial plate. It is because these individuals do step up that we as a state are not looking at creating orphanages up and down New Zealand with which to house these close to 10,000 children. Reports have also revealed alarming statistics for for that 47% of caregivers um, for 40% of caregivers, their total family income was less than $30,000 per annum. Almost 39% were solo carers, weighted heavily towards women who were particularly financially compromised. Several described their struggle to feed and clothe themselves and the children adequately. One stated a wish not to go to bed hungry and for clothes that fit. The incident of kinship care varies across cultures, with 53% of Māori children in need of care placed with whānau, 59% of Pacific Island children placed with whonor, compared to 31% Pākehā children placed with extended family. This study evidenced that the children in whānau family care do well, but that the lack of parity around the application of the clothing allowance is contributing to the difficulties their children and their caregivers experienced. The state has calculated the rate at which the clothing allowance is required inside certain age brackets for children. But the Act creates a situation where, if you are related to the person who steps up to look after you, then you apparently no longer need that support. 
There was no other criteria that affects this decision. It is completely based on blood relationship. A Labour government acknowledged this issue. A national government has acknowledged this issue. It is time to stop talking about it and time to take action. I implore all parties in this House, on behalf of these children and carers, to support this bill to split committee. I commend the bill to the House. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Speaker. I call the Honourable Member Basatis.